Hi there. In this section, we'll talk about uh, function operations, at least composition, and then inverse functions. So there are various ways of combining functions, but the one that's most interesting to us is functional composition. You can think of a function as a process. I start with some input and I get some output. So we can imagine I start with my input and then I have a process and I get some output. But then if there's another process, we can imagine, oh, that thing that was output, let's make that input for something else. And then I get a final output. So if we do two steps in a row, two processes in a row, we can really just think that's one big process. At the end of the day, I started with this input and I got this final output. So this whole thing we can think of as two processes or one process. So the idea is if I do functions back to back, that's really just a function. So this is what's known as a composite function or a composition. The notation for this uses this little circle. It's not the letter O, although it is very similar in appearance. And if we see two functions with the circle between them, it just means do them back to back. F circle G of X by definition just means F of G of X. Um, so we would figure out g of x and then do f to it. Uh, one thing I want to point out is as we read this left to right, the f is first and the g is second. But since the g is inside these parentheses here, we actually think about applying g first. So let's just look at some examples. Suppose that the function f is 3x plus 1 and the function g is given by the rule x squared. So f circle g of 2 means f of g of 2. Right? This is just our symbol for do the functions back to back. Inside the parentheses g of 2, right? from this rule g of 2 would be 4. So this is f of 4 and f of 4 is 13 if we apply the rule for uh, f. So with that in mind, uh, if you're watching this, pause and do these next few. Okay, I hope you've done that. So you can always get the ball rolling by just writing what this means with parentheses instead of that circle. This is g of f of 2. f of 2 by that formula is 7, and g is the squaring function. 7 squared is 49. This next one is f of g of negative 4. g of negative 4 is 16. f of 16 would be 3 times 16 plus 1 which is also 49, just by a coincidence. Here we would have g of f of 0. f of 0 is 1. And g of 1 is 1. Here, it's two f's, but that's okay. That means f of f of 4. f of 4 is 13. So this is f of 13, and f of 13 would be 40. Now for these last ones, we're going to have a formula. We're not computing a specific number. We're thinking, okay, this is some expression with an x in it, but can I make it simple? So get the ball rolling by just write it with the parentheses instead of the circle. And g of x, we know, is x squared. So this is f of x squared. Now, to express what this means, we really want to pay attention to thinking of functions not as just these letters, but what is happening as a process. f of x means I'm taking 3 times x and adding 1. But this name x is just a placeholder. I could call it anything. f of y is 3 times y plus 1. f of t is 3 times t plus 1. The way you should always think about this, you don't have to write it down, but you really want to think, I just have some input. What does f do to its input? It's 3 times the input, and then I add 1. So if the input is x squared, then I have 3 times x squared, and then I add 1. 3x squared plus 1. Here we have g of g of x. g of x, as before, is x squared. 
well, what is g? Here, g of x is x squared, but that just means g of the input is the input squared. This is just a function that squares things. Whatever I'm giving it as my in input, that my output is just that thing squared. So this would be x squared squared, which is x to the fourth. Okay, so now we'll move on to section 6-7, which talks about inverse relations and inverse functions, but we're really going to focus on inverse functions. So functions are uh, inverse functions if essentially whatever one of them does, the other one undoes. So here is our very official way of saying it. If we do f circle g of x, we just get back to x. Right? This is saying if I do f and g back to back, it's as though I didn't do anything. And technically speaking, it's true in the other order as well. g of f of x is x. They are two functions where when I do them back to back, I just get what I started with. You might imagine an example like f of x is the function that adds 5, and g of x is the function that subtracts 5. If I do something like f circle g of 7, that's f of g of 7. g of 7 is 2, but f of 2 is 7. I did these functions back to back, and it's as though they canceled each other out. You can think, whatever f does, g undoes. Sometimes we could draw a little leap, uh, diagram here. Here is 7, here is 2. F takes 7 and... Oops, sorry. I have this reversed. G takes 7 and turns it into 2. F takes 2 and turns it into 7. It's the same relationship, but forwards and backwards. Um, now, the domain can be important, but we're not really going to stress about that. There are cases where, where there's only an inverse function if we restrict to certain values of x, but... I would always set it up so that's okay for you. We have a notation for inverse functions where we use a superscript of negative 1. So in this case, we could say, for example, that f of x, if I wanted to emphasize that it is the inverse of g, I could put a little superscript of negative 1 next to the g. Or I could say that g... is the inverse of f. This is not an exponent, but it looks like an exponent. The little minus 1 next to the name of a function is your way of indicating that it's the backwards inverse version of that function. So if we have two functions and want to know if they are inverses, we can just kind of guess a number and see if there's numerical evidence. So here I'm just throwing two functions at you. And can we find n numerical evidence that we believe these are functions? So what you can do is you can just pick a number somewhat randomly. Let's suppose I have 5. f of 5, according to this rule, would be 3 times 5 minus 6, which is 15 minus 6, which is 9. So f is a function that starts with 5, and turns it into 9. Well, what happens if I take g of 9? g of 9 would be 1 third of 9 plus 2, which is 3 plus 2, which is 5. The chances that this happened randomly with the very first number we picked is very small. Theoretically, maybe we just got very lucky. But this is evidence that we probably do have a pair of functions that are truly backwards versions of each other. Because the very first number we picked demonstrated this property. There's a good chance that it's always true. Now, we could prove it very formally by literally composing the functions with a generic x in there. So I will show this to you. This is super formal and not really the kind of thing you would need to do. 
But f circle g of x means f of g of x, which means f of 1 third x plus 2. f here is the function that takes 3 times its input and subtracts 6. So 3 times this whole input, and then we subtract 6. So I'll distribute, the 6's cancel, and we get x. So I'm doing f and g back to back, and I'm just left with the x I started with. If we're being super duper thorough, we should check it in the other order. g circle f of x is g of f of x, which is g of 3x minus 6. g is the function that takes one third of its input and adds 2. We distribute the one third, we get x minus 2 plus 2, and that's x. So in either order, they cancel each other out for the most generic of x. So absolutely, these are inverse functions. Um, a useful fact is that a function will have an inverse function if it never repeats output values. Such functions are called one to one. And we can tell something is one to one on a graph by what's called the horizontal line test. If every horizontal line hits the graph only once, or perhaps not at all, then we can take an inverse. So this passes, right? this is the graph of y equals f of x. This passes the horizontal line test. And therefore it has an inverse, an inverse function. If we have something that fails the horizontal line test, right? imagine that I have two points here with the same y value. Maybe here's 6, 7, here's 1, 7 on a function g. So we're noticing that g of 1 is equal to 7, and g of 6 is equal to 7. If there were an inverse function, I should be able to turn this backwards. If g of 1 is equal to 7, that means for the inverse version, g inverse of 7 should be equal to 1. Input and output get reversed. But by that same logic, for this second fact, g inverse of 7 is 6. And here we have a contradiction. No function can give us two different answers. People will sometimes talk about the idea of an inverse relation. But there is no function that is the inverse of g. And we could notice that by noticing we have a repeated y value for g. Now, once we have a function that's one-to-one -one and has an inverse function, it would be nice if we could find a formula for that. Instead of just saying, oh, yeah, 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 this has an inverse function, let's figure out what it is. So I will show you how to do this. I'm temporarily skipping those bullet points. And I will walk you through, and then we will think about what that means, and you can practice a little bit. So I want to find the inverse function of this function f of x is 4x minus 2. So instead of using the function notation, I'll just use the letter y. We think that x is the input, y is the output. We'll write it that way. But when we have an inverse function, it's the backwards version. So one way of achieving that backwardsness is to swap input and output. Right? We're reversing what we think of as input, what we think of as output, to get this inverse version. So the trick is, in whatever equation you have written down, just switch the variables. Every x becomes y and every y becomes x. And now we're going to solve this for y. So I can add 2 to each side. And then I can divide each side by 4. And this is the backwards version. So this would be our formula for f inverse of x. It's x plus 2 over 4. And let's check this. I will pick a number. Let's say 7. f of 7 would be 4 times 7 minus 2, which is 28 minus 2, which is 26. 
let's see if f inverse has the reverse relationship. f inverse of 26, according to this formula, would be 26 plus 2 over 4. That's 28 over 4, which is 7. So that's what we want to see. One function started with 7 and turned it into 26. The other function started with 26 and turned it into 7. The chances that this worked out by dumb luck, especially after all these steps, pretty much is zero. So what did we just do? I wrote the function rule without function notation. I just used y as the name of the output. And then this is what creates that inverseness. We switched the variables. Every x becomes y, every y becomes x, so we're swapping input and output. Then we solve for this new y. We present our formula using inverse function notation. And then hopefully you test it. You've done all this work. It's pretty quick to test. See if you have it right. So here are three examples to try. For this one, there's actually a slight error. Um, we actually want to assume here that, uh, yeah, well, no, this is fine. But d don't dwell on this. Uh, if you find yourself, yeah. So assume the original x is greater than or equal to 0. There might be some other assumption there. Right? But don't, you can sort of ignore this, but I'll just say use your intuition. In the original, x is bigger than 0. So for these three examples, try following the steps. The process is here. If you get stuck, ask yourself, what do I do first? What do I do second? What do I do third? The algebra might be tricky in an individual case but give it your best shot. Hit pause and actually try all three of these. Okay, I hope you have tried these. So, I write it with a Y, and I switch the variables. So now we solve for the new Y. I'll multiply each side by 3. So 3X three equals Y minus 1, which means Y is 3X minus 1. So our inverse function here seems to have as its formula 3x plus 1. And let's check. g of 7 would be 7 minus 1 over 3, which is 6 over 3, which is 2. g inverse of 2 would be 3 times 2 plus 1, which is 7. So one of these functions takes 7 and turns it into 2. One of them takes 2 and turns it into 7. Looks good. Okay. This one, same idea. y equals 2x squared plus 3, and we'll switch those variables. We want to get y by itself. So I will subtract 3. I will divide by 2. And now I will take a square root. So y is the square root of x minus 3. And this is where there's this assumption that the original x is greater than 0. And the new x, which is sort of the y, is greater than or equal to 3. Don't really panic about that. So this seems to be our formula. h inverse of x is the square root of x minus 3 over 2. Let's check this. h of 2 would be 2 times 2 squared plus 3. That's 8 plus 3, which is 11. h inverse of 11 would be the square root of 11 minus 3 over 2. 11 minus 3 is 8. This is the square root of 4. And that's 2. So one function started with 2 and gave us 11. The other function started with 11 and gave us 2. One more. y equals 2 over x plus 1. I switch the variables. x equals 2 over y plus 1. Anytime you see a fraction that you don't want to have, you can multiply both sides of the equation by the denominator. 
put the whole thing in parentheses. So on this side, we have y plus 1 times x. On this side, it is just to the number 2. Multiplying by the denominator will always clear out that fraction. And we're trying to get y by itself. So I might divide by x. And then to get y by itself, I can just subtract 1. We have 2 over x minus 1. So our formula here for k inverse of x is 2 over x minus 1. Make it crystal clear that here is the fraction, and we are subtracting that 1 outside of the fraction. Let's test this. k of 3. k of 3 would be 2 over 3 plus 1, which is 2 over 4, which is 1 half k inverse of 1 half would be 2 over 1 half minus 1. Dividing by a fraction means multiplying by its reciprocal. This is 2 times 2, so 4 minus 1, which is 3. One of these started with 3 and gave us 1 half. The other one started with 1 half and gave us 3. You definitely want to practice this. And as you're practicing, always come back to what are the steps. Don't do it by intuition. Follow the steps. The algebraic steps might be a little bit different from case to case, but the structural steps are always the same. Okay, that is it for this video.